reflecting on for Show the Love 2021. Uh, the next one will be next Friday at the same time, one till two, and that's a craftivism and climate action event. Now I've been practicing trying to put my teeth right to say craftivism. It's not the easiest of words, but it's a really interesting thing, craftivism, where you're uh, campaigning through craft medium. And you can see behind me that I've done a little bit of paper folding for uh, Green Hearts uh, for this event today. Uh, so although we haven't been able to get together physically this year to celebrate Show the Love, uh, I know a lot of federations and WIs have been putting on events to celebrate Show the Love again this year and have been as inventive as ever in how they discuss issues and uh, how they display their passion for the Show the Love campaign. We've seen pictures of many different events and had reports of some really successful events uh, with high profile policymakers. So thank you all that have taken part in events. And if you haven't to date, there's still time to do so. Um, every little step that we take makes a difference. So today uh, we're going to hear speakers from two organizations that are close to um, our members' hearts. Um, and they're Emma Burt and Chrissy Lahore from the RSPB. Uh, and they will be letting you know about their Join the Dots and their Revive Our World campaigns um, and how you can show the love for nature and wildlife from your home. Um, and we also have Keith Jones, who is the National Specialist for Climate Change at the National Trust and we'll be giving you all a sneak preview of a new National Trust campaign and how you can do the small things to take action on climate change. There will be time for around 10 to 15 minutes of questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have any questions, either keep them for the end of the session or pop them in the chat box and this will be monitored and we can return to them at the end. So just to remind you again before we start that the meeting is being recorded and by remaining on the call you are consenting to being recorded and please turn off your camera if you don't want to be identified publicly. So on with the meeting and let's welcome our first speaker and give a very warm welcome to Keith Jones from the National Trust. Over to you Keith. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking to you from a very blue sky to Snowdonia uh, at the moment, just before the big weather um, kicks in uh, again. I'm talking about climate change and global warming, and it's about minus one outside, so it's a little bit ironic, but it, the weather is what the weather uh, is. We're seeing with increased changes in uh, climate that we're getting variable weather. It's getting more extreme. We can be the Arctic and the Sahara within about 10 days, as we've seen over the last few years. Um, the National Trust has been working uh, on climate change because it sees it as the single biggest threat to our core purpose um, as an organization. We want to know more about it. And, and quite often, um, when I'm talking to people at climate change, the first question I can see people thinking is, what does it mean to me, right? Globally, there's all sorts of problems, but what can I do? What am I going to be the victim of uh, everything that's, uh, that's happening? So the Trust have, has had a world of flooding uh, again in December. We're seeing extreme weather events. I think we, there was a big wildfire down in Dartmoor yesterday. That's probably human driven. Uh, on it, but uh, because the soil is drier, because the, there's more stress in the system, the fires we're, we're seeing is getting bigger. So next slide, please. This is my house. It's where I live. This is my community. This is my area. And so as you can see, climate change is quite personal um, to me uh, on it. So I think the one on the left was Storm Desmond. Um, I live in an old mill, so everything is targeted to pushing water towards my house. Um, but my house has got away with it rather than it's been designed to deal with climate change. That's the village of Llanberis down bottom right hand corner. And that's the uh, the road in Nantperis uh, above it. So we're seeing more and more 
uh, impacts. We've always had floods. We've always had, had high wind events, but we're getting more of them and more often um, now. We're getting drought and flood and all sorts of things um, day to day. So for me, it's also very personal. Um, I, I live up up in the mountains. I don't live in a floodplain. I, I live about 800 feet up the side of a mountain. And yet I'm, I'm still seeing this day to day, which is the question that a lot of people want to know. What does the near, medium and distant future mean to me and my family, my community and my area? Next slide, please. So we did quite a large event for the National Trust Executive, uh, answering that question, not in a personal, but in an organizational uh, view. What are we seeing today? What are we seeing? It's one of the questions I ask at the properties I go to visit is, what's different? What are you now doing that you didn't used to have to do uh, uh, on it? So bottom right-hand corner, that was Marsden Moor, um, where 250,000 pounds of of environmental work went up in smoke in three days on it. Burning peat, burning heather, burning a, a lot of stuff. Okay, it was caused by a disposable barbecue, which is, we can't legislate against that. But because the soil was so dry and because we'd been managing the heather in, in order to create structure for black grouse and various other uh, birds and animals there, it still went up. And when it went up, it went up properly, destroying an awful lot uh, of stuff. In the middle, you've got the White, Ho White Horse of Effington, um, which is thousands of years old. But now, because the soil is drying out so quickly, and because of people are walking around it, they're, create, they're, they're going through the topsoil because the grass isn't able to grow. The topsoil is blowing through and it's creating damage uh, on it. Although human beings are sort of creating the damage, climate change is the magnifier. It creates the conditions uh, for it. Uh, the painting, I think it's the trip. Oh, I can never remember. Look, I'm not a painting specialist. This is the triptych up in, uh, is it Tatton? Oh, somewhere in the Midlands. It's cracking. It blistered in 2018 uh, in storage. We're seeing more uh, degradation on it. These things are not used to the climate we've got. Uh, we're getting big wind throughs, big uh, trees. Powys Castle is a classic where you've got six and seven hundred year old oaks. We're now losing them at an unsustainable rate. They're not being able to be replaced. Is it the wrong tree now in the in the wrong place? The, it's big, wide open canopies. Leaves are coming out and staying out longer, coming out earlier. The soil is wetter for longer. The winds are stronger. And then you put what's called a multiplier of pest and disease on top of it. We're, we're seeing more of this. Pest and disease is now endemic. We're seeing a lot more box blight. We're seeing heather beetle infestation. So all of these are, to me, they're the canaries in the mine. They're flagging change. We're seeing more and more uh, of it. The bottom left-hand corner, which was an interesting piece of work we did with um, visitor behavior. Uh, at 28 degrees centigrade or 82 degrees Fahrenheit, for some strange reason, people don't want to go indoors. Uh, in National Trust mansions. And so is this something we need to consider going forward? If we've got a model that pays for conservation through people coming through the doors, as well as all the other uh, income streams. So, so it is a real threat to conservation, even though it's the economy that's driving the conservation. So we're just at the moment looking at what are we facing into before we go into the doing bit, uh, what adaptation and what things that do, do we need to do. Next slide, please. So th this is the preview. This will be hitting the press in about two and a half weeks time. What we've been doing is something called difference mapping, uh, using a lot of data from a lot of institutions, Met Office, British Geological Society, and looking at different factors um, across the UK. But this is this is based on the worst case. If we don't do anything, if we carry on with our carbon emissions, where are we going to be most impacted? So the barn on the right hand side was it quite a good condition, but the roof fell in, the back wall collapsed in, in one weekend because of something called shrink heave. What happens with clay when it dries out, it shrinks back. When then it gets really wet, it expands. So your building is basically on a small trampoline all the time. We've seen it in Coles Hill, we've seen it increasing cottage cracking. So what the trust wanted to do, the picture on the left hand side is the today picture, the 2020 
uh, picture. The picture on the right hand side is 2060. Where are we most exposed? We've done it with flood, we've done it with storm impact, we've done it with quite a few elements just to see where the organization's most exposed and what do we have there? So, and how does that thing be habitat or building or activity or footpaths or whatever, how does it react with this change? And therefore, what do we need to keep an eye out um, on? Our insurance claims are got starting to spiral upwards just on cracking in historic cottages because of shrink heave. For, for example, on it, we're seeing increased storm impacts now in the west um, of the country. So it, it is being, what we're trying to do is be informed, see what we're, what the risk looks like before we then react, doing all sorts of things in, in lots of places. We'll be launching the press release on all of the hazards that we've mapped, looking at what we own there and showing you how many of our special places are at risk from different hazards rather than all of them in one place. Next slide, please. So it's quite... Um, it's too clever for me, but basically what we're doing is we're pulling in a lot of existing data because it's one of our feedbacks to a lot of the uh, research institutes. Is they all seem to develop data in their own place for their own needs. Nobody seems to be bringing it together. So the long list on the right hand side is what exists and what we're now pulling into the system so that we can see what does the future look like? What does it mean to my place, to my uh, to my house, to me personally. So we're eventually looking at uh, launching this publicly. At the moment, it's it's a, it's, it's quite complex. So it uh, we're developing for internal experts to translate to site managers. Because if you just see a red hexagon, it doesn't mean you're in imminent danger of seeing something. You then need to translate it to place, to site, to thing, to an activity that you're doing. Next slide, please. So this was the one we did uh, with Oxford University. Um, on the left-hand side, um, that's 200 million data points, as Oxford call them. I call them visitors. That's, that's 10 years of visitors coming to our places. Then what Oxford did then, they matched those places to the local weather stations just to see how people behaved. So what happened at 25 degrees centigrade? What happened at 28 degrees centigrade? So and the map on the right hand side is the ones that behaved with the weather and the ones with white, they don't behave and we don't know why. Why did people still go there? What's the difference between a red one, which shows 28 degrees, they don't come, and a white one, 28 degrees, and they do come. Is it the offer? Is it the shade? So this is part of the work we're doing. Bottom right hand corner is according to the Met Office, the 2018 summer, which is a hot summer, and we had lots of hot events, will happen every other year. And therefore, it's not exceptional. It won't be exceptional weather. It'll just be weather on it. The exceptional uh, years will be significantly hotter. And therefore, for an organization that depends on income to do its conservation work, what does that mean to us? Currently, people are behaving this way. Will they be behaving the same way in 2050? That's part of the research that we're doing. Next slide, please. It's this variability that really challenges um, us. So th these two events, more or less, they're 12 months apart. Uh, one was a 26, 27 degree February half term, and the other was the beast from the east. Okay, they were about a month apart. But if you're trying to plan or do things, it, it doesn't have muck your calculations up if nobody can turn up and you've bought all the salad um, for it, all the way through to stocking, it, all sorts of impacts uh, that happen happen from it. So the what we call the adaptation response or what do we do in terms of the business, the conservation, the charity, everything, that, that's the work that we're currently doing. We're trying to be an informed organization to make these decisions. And having looked at this in quite a lot of detail, it's also what we all need really if you're planning a thing, if you're planning your garden or if you're planning your conservatory, if you're planning your roof design, if you're planning all sorts of elements, you need to know what's coming. At the moment, where uh, all of us are basing our decisions on what has been. Uh, it doesn't mean what has been will be in the future as well. Next slide, please. So 
we are we're working on worst case scenario. All of these graphs basically just tell us the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere at the moment is is tracking the worst case scenario. We're dead on track on it. The ones on the lower, the the blue ones and the orange one and the brown ones show what we should be doing. But at the moment, the black line is showing that we're we're following the the worst case scenario. So everything that we've modelled is is working on this. Hopefully, we're just planning for the worst. And, uh, but we're hoping for the best on it. But we need to know what does it look like to place to people to activity as a conservation charity. But we're also working with government in this in, in terms of, look, you're working on a lot of stuff. Individuals and organizations need this stuff in order to make decisions, especially long-term investments. Next slide, please. So here's a, here's a nice example of adaptation and adaptation. This is Ham House in Richmond upon Thames. So we worked with the property team and asking the questions is what's different here? What are you now doing that you didn't used to do uh, on it? That's the, that's the top box. We're, they're seeing more pest and disease. They're seeing uh, some more heat at site. So um, Ham House 2019 has had to close the house for the first time ever because the internal temperatures were over 40 degrees centigrade so it wasn't a safe place but what does 2050 look like and as you can see heat is a big element in there so what can you do with a georgian mansion or your woodland or your habitats in terms of adapting the best thing that you can do to start with is just to get it into a good condition it's like a human being if you're fit you're more able to deal with the knocks uh, that comes the the it's called, I was informed it's called the parterre or the flat green bit in front of the mansion has been suffering because of increasing drought events and been turning yellow. So what the property team did is they planted a quarter of a million Mediterranean bulbs uh, in, in, the med, in, the, in the grassy bit. And the benefit of it, it maintained colour, it got biodiversity and it got a lot of pollinators in. But as a business, it also grew. We had 20% more visitors because there was there was colour, there was uh, something in there. But the primary purpose of the bulb planting was for biodiversity and for pollinators um, in the area. But there were other benefits of doing it. This, this is back to making informed decisions uh, on it. Next slide, please. This, this is where it gets, for me, it gets really complex. Um, so this is Cantre Reservoir, uh, which supplies most of Swansea in all of Cardiff with its drinking water. They're now getting what's called um, red events. Cardiff's drinking water turns into a very mild rosé in terms of colour because of landslides in the Brecon Beacons on it. That's because of soil over drying and then over wetting and landslides coming down. That's then caused by the type of soil they've got there. So we need to look at keeping the soil there and not taking it out of the taps at the far end uh, of it. The top wall on the right hand corner is uh, Coles Hill Estate down by Swindon. Uh, again, this is this is the this is the soil causing this because of what the weather is doing. This is the estate wall around the whole estate. 150 meters of it fell one night, and again, it's tr it's trying to work with natural processes. What can we do there in terms of is it tree planting? Is it taller grass? Is it different biodiversity? We're trying to work with what's called nature-based solutions. Engineering is always limited, but nature is usually a lot better than the engineering results uh, of it. Next slide, please. So we've been talking, of, I haven't really talked about the cause, which of course is the increasing carbon um, element uh, in it. And I, I really like uh, this work that the trust is doing. It's called slowing the flow. We're working with almost non-engineering solutions of keeping the water in the uplands and not letting it shoot through the system. By the time it's reached the town, it's too late. It, it costs a fortune to reinforce flood uh, events down in the town. But if you can keep it in the soil, in the uplands and slow the flow down, you then don't have to react in a quite an expensive engineering and also disruptive way to people down um, in, the uh, in the towns. So we're doing, we're doing a lot of this, but so are a lot of organizations because working with what's called nature-based solutions is significantly cheaper and you get so much um, more out of it especially in biodiversity uh, gain we've we've used we've used beavers in some places um, Hidcut for example and they're really good dam engineers but it does slow the flow it does increase the biodiversity value uh, in the areas next slide please 
back to the building side of it I, again to me this is learning from the past this is um it's co it's called slate hanging so what you've got here is Dufferin Mumber um it's a listed building it's 300 years old we were seeing increasing damp uh, penetrating into the buildings. Old buildings have been designed to let water into the wall. And then as the summer hots up, it then dries them out. That, that's why you've got really thick gables uh, on an awful lot of old cottages. But this house was getting damper and damper. The advice we got to start with was repointed. We repointed it twice on it and it didn't work. But if you look around the area, you can see quite a lot of gables um, are, that, are either covered in corrugated sheet or in slate. And this, this worked for this cottage because it was appropriate. It was vernacular from the area and it cured the problem 100%. So we've got a lot of stuff to learn from the past. It's not just a, this company's made this fantastic wonder material that will do a thing uh, into it. This is, the cottage is now warm because if it's damp, it's, it feels even colder uh, onto it. So learning from the past and planning for the future is part of our mantra really here. Next one, please. But we also have to plan for loss or change, dramatic change. This uh, the bot picture in the bottom right-hand corner hasn't happened yet. This is Mullion Harbour. This is somebody clever with a photograph in it. But we are planning for complete loss and complete change. So we're working with the community um, there in order to see how we do it. So at the moment, what we're working on is how often should we repair? When do we stop repairing? How do we pull back from it? And this is just one example of, of the decisions that we're going to have to do as a society here. But there will also be gain uh, coming through species the, the the harvesting season could be longer species that we couldn't grow before we can probably um, grow the coast is going to get busier because people want access to water so it's not all about loss it is about change but we have to plan for change on it. next slide please so carbon this is a really complex slide to uh, we ask the question is who owns the carbon is it if i drive my car is it my carbon or is it the is it the fossil fuel company that owns the carbon or is it the country that owns the carbon so the trust has developed an approach of identifying wh where we emit carbon or what's called carbon equivalents, everything from nitrous oxides to methanes and all sorts of stuff. And then looking at the something called a scheme of control. Do we control that carbon? As in, if we change something, it reduces. If we control it, we own it, and therefore we have to do something about it. If somebody else owns it, the supply chain or the stuff we buy, we can buy differently, or we can work with suppliers, or we can work with individuals to enable them to shift this, car this carbon. Because at the moment, a lot of this carbon is treated as separately, but actually it's the same stuff that goes into the atmosphere. So the Trust have issued a net zero carbon target. That's, that's lovely, but what does it look like and what does it mean and what does it impact because an awful lot of organizations have said net zero but if you look at it in detail when it gets really difficult you can sometimes ignore the really difficult uh, elements of it when looking at the trust carbon footprint the fossil fuel that we directly use is actually only two percent of our carbon everything else from land from soil from investments from suppliers from travel and transport that makes up the the elephant in the room and that's what we're working on now in order to get it down to zero by 2030 and it is a big challenge uh, on it but we i the, the guy I work with on it is is really good in looking at it in a pragmatic sort of way that the lack of information doesn't shouldn't stop you taking a decision if the decision makes sense on it the data can ca ca catch you up later down the line next slide please right so I I, I was thinking about the um I was going to quote Dewi Sand here, and he used to say, do the little things, because they all add up to an awful lot. We need to be more informed in terms of our decision making. We need to be carbon intelligent. But I think carbon, and there is no difference to me between carbon and nature conservation. Good nature conservation actually delivers good carbon benefits. It, it reduces, it keeps it where it where it should be going. Should I be buying this? Should I, but at the moment, the labeling doesn't help and it's really confusing. I looked at um, 
I looked at uh, developing one net zero food offering in the trust and it is so complicated from soil to waste everything has a carbon element to it you may, it may leave the farm as carb as carbon free but the lorry that drives it from it isn't the production factory may not be the waste at the end may uh, leak methane out so it, it's been an interesting challenge uh, on it because um, the trust is trying to demonstrate what it's doing so one of the big areas at the moment uh, has been looking at how do we share and how do we gain. So we formed um, with the RSPB and a lot of other organizations something called the Fit for the Future Network. And it's for practitioners to share and learn. Uh, it's, been, it's been going for about six years now. Uh, it's, for me, it's a simple question. Who knows? Who's got? Who's tried? Who, who, can somebody point me in the direction of rather than making endless case studies uh, of it? It's about sharing and it's about gaining. So it, in my own life, um, I've, I've decided not to fly and it's really, really, really difficult <laughs> not to fly to places. But I have to say that one of the silver linings from COVID is it's got us onto the video conferencing in a big way. It's getting it to work. It's now normalizing the stuff. So I was on a telephone conference uh, this morning with people from all over the world. And when normally we'd insist on a buffet and sitting down and going all over the place. So it, it's been an, in, it is not, it's not been, it is an interesting process. We definitely don't have all of the answers, but I think we're asking the questions better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith, for that. Um, from the chat column, I can see that people have been enthralled by your uh, talk and the different viewpoint, because I don't think uh, many of us have realized the huge impact this would have on an organization like the National Trust. Um, and we all realize that uh, tackling net zero uh, is going to be difficult. But as you say, it's uh, not an easy fix to get there. But if we do the little things, then there's every chance that we will get to net zero at some point soon. Uh, and it must be our aim to do it. Um, I'll move on to the next speaker and then we'll have questions at the end of both sessions, if that's okay. So I'd like to next welcome Emma Burt and Chrissy Lermure, uh, and they're both from the RSPB. A very warm welcome to you both. I'm not sure who is going to start first. <laughs> Emma's going to kick us off, I think. Yeah, hi guys. It's so lovely to meet everyone. And thank you in advance to Tobias, who's going to be switching switching our presentation through. Um, so yes, uh, a very warm welcome to you all from the RSPB. Thank you so much for having us. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we just wanted to come and chat to you guys about what the RSPB is doing um, in, in relation to climate change and the nature and uh, climate crises that are going on at the moment. And we wanted to start it off by just introducing ourselves and what, where we come from, a little bit about us. So um, I am Emma Burt and I'm the Community Empowerment Development Manager, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, but essentially means that I work in this really, really tiny but wonderful team at the RSPB that helps communities across all four countries of the UK to better connect with nature and hopefully have a really, really wonderful relationship with it and therefore act towards nature, as I'm sure so many of you guys already do. Um, so yeah, I come from a background of working with incredibly deprived communities, um, minority groups. I do, I've done a lot of public engagement and community work, um, but I'm also creative. So I come from an arts background as well. I love people, place and planet. Um, and I've just got a real passion for ensuring access to nature is inclusive to all, which I know that we're all very aware is not necessarily um, happening at the moment. So very committed to communities across the UK, um, inspiring them, giving them access to nature um, and hopefully um, allowing and facilitating action for nature as well. So I'll pass over to Chrissy, who will tell you guys a bit about what she does. Thank you, Emma. Uh, yeah, so I'm Chrissy. Um, my last name, Lahure, um, sounds like a funny one. I'm from Guernsey, so um, that's where my name comes from. I live in Cornwall now with my husband. Um, I've got a background in uh, animal management and also wildlife conservation, uh, but I've got a real passion for activism, um, campaigning for social equality, um, the environment and particularly nature, obviously. So 
I'm uh, really keen on getting outdoors and hiking and birding and looking for wildlife. Um, yeah, those are my main passions, really. I could list off all sorts of things I love to do, but I'd be here for a long time. So that's, but that's really what drew me to the campaign's job at the RSPB is having the opportunity to create sort of political change um, and in terms of fighting for nature's recovery. Thank you. Absolutely. So even though, uh, as I'm sure you guys can probably see, we do work in very, very different, different specialities. So myself with, with communities and Chrissy on the campaigns team, but we both sit within what is called the movement building team at the RSPB. It's quite a new um, team. But it's wonderful. It's a really lovely space to be working within because not only do we have community and campaigning staff like my, Chrissy and myself, we've also actually got the family education and youth team and engagement staff. So it's a really, really unusual space. And it's looking at how we can reshape um, the RSPB's approach and build on the existing incredible work that the RSPB's has done for many years um, to inspire more diverse audiences to act for nature. So next slide, please, Tobias. So very, very quickly, what actually is a movement and what, what's a movement got to do with showing the love for nature? Well, essentially, um, here's a quick de uh, definition you can see on the, the presentation slide. We've actually taken inspiration from other movement builders. There are specific organizations that are all around supporting creating movements and we've come up with this summary a diverse voices coming together for a common cause to affect positive change. A group of people with a shared purpose, like the WI, who create change together. And it's normally made up of leaders, powerful grassroots support, solid partnerships, and a shared goal or plan, which is often political for the future. So you can see why communities and campaigning are so essential within that frame. So let's emphasize our vision to ensure we are connecting with local communities and putting time to growing from the ground up. I'll hand over to Chrissy. If you don't mind changing the slide, Tobias, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So um, at the RSPB, what we're really keen on doing is supporting movements that already exist. So essentially creating a support system. So there's lots of amazing people out there already doing amazing things in terms of nature and climate. Um, and we're really best placed to lend the skills and knowledge that we already have um, to that movement. Um, there's also skills and knowledge that other people have, other organizations and individuals that we don't have. And by pooling our resources and coming together, we can have a much larger impact than having lots of different movements around the UK basically acting separately. So that's really what we're trying to do in our department. Like Emma said, we're quite new. So as a lot of our projects are still in development, but we've already got some really great work going on with schools um, and youth groups um, working a lot more closely with youth groups, which is really exciting because they're extremely passionate about, about all of these issues. Um, oh, sorry, my computer. Yeah, we're, I think Emma, you've covered my last section of this slide. So I'll ask Tobias to move on. <laughs> yep, thank you. So we work in a number of different areas or themes um, in the movement building team. So ultimately, obviously, we're looking at connecting people together, but also connecting people to nature um, and trying to make that far more inclusive. Um, across the UK, there's a real inequality in access to nature, which I think was highlighted during lockdown. Um, and we really want to make sure that that becomes a cornerstone of what we're fighting for, is making sure that everybody has access to nature rich spaces. Um, and we're looking at trying to do this in more exciting ways. So through arts and through music, as well as uh, classic conservation. Um, EDI is a real um, theme at the moment. We've got a team working specifically on this and we really want to make sure that what we're delivering for you is um, reaches a wider community and making it a lot more accessible um, and inclusive through everything that we do. Obviously campaigns, so that's my area. Um, in terms of upskilling people, we're really keen to make sure that we impart our wisdom basically and give you tools and resources and training to really campaign for yourselves. So take issues that you're really concerned about in your local areas and create campaigns for yourselves. Um, and also as well as supporting RSPB and um, signposting you to others within the movement as well. Um, community, so developing projects that ensure communities are supported a bit like campaigns, we interact quite closely um, and making sure, again, that you all have access to um, our resources and to the natural world 
and to each other as well which obviously is becoming a lot more difficult um, because of COVID. So we're working really hard to adapt and deliver uh, projects to you that are safe to, to engage with. And of course, like we said, um, being a part of something that's really big. So something that the campaigns team is really keen to sort of communicate is that um, being part of, despite one of the images we had earlier, being part of the climate movement is more than just what the media shows us. So all of those pictures of um, people marching and climate strikes, those are a really core cool part and always have been a really core cool part of campaigning. So, you know, we saw that through um, women's um, rights and civil rights movements. They are a really core cool part of campaigning, but there's so many other spaces that people can operate in from um, working with teachers, working with schools, if it's just connecting with nature in your local communities, coming together um, to do workshops, coming together in groups in your local villages. Those are all really key, key parts of the movement as well. And we really want to emphasize that whatever little pocket you think you sit in, that you are part of a bigger movement and you all really do come together to create a massive impact. So yes, um, Tobias, could you move on and I'll pass back to Emma. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, so really, really quickly, um, what actually is a community? What do we mean by that, guys? Uh, as you can see on the slide, um, we've actually put out two definitions because th there are there is the community and a community. So the community is the people, places, neighbourhood, wider neighbourhoods um, in many instances that you engage or may engage with. And a community is a group of people with a common interest like the WI, the fantastic people that you are. So um, it's always good to remember, however, that every community is unique, much like the individuals that they consist of. So it's really essential that whatever the work the RSPB does, whether through campaigns or conservation, we should not um, assume the needs of that community and, and we need to make sure that we are co-creating and we are coming from a space of inclusion um, so that the work not only benefits us as an organisation but also benefits the people that essentially the work is going to impact. So it's about taking the principles of grassroots movements and applying that to our approach with communities. And it's also really, really important nowadays, um, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, and, and what we're doing right now is, is a really, really lovely um, illustration of this, that community isn't always the obvious visual. It's not always that group of folk who meet in the local library for a book club or in the pub or at a local scouts group. Uh, a community can actually be invisible nowadays, brought together virtually through online platforms such as this, uh, through Facebook, or maybe it's that group of guys that get together and uh, just love doing gaming every Tuesday, who knows? As our definition outlines, hopefully any group of people with a shared interest can be viewed as a community. So what are we actually doing for and with communities these days? If you don't mind changing the slide, Tobias. Thank you. So um, one basic premise, uh, what, sorry, one basic, um, one project that we've been working on recently uh, is called Actions for Nature. And you guys may have seen this. We've been putting it out across our social media. So if you follow us, you may have seen that. And we've also had links on our website. Um, so what, what is Actions for Nature? I'll really quickly go through it. The basic premise was one of asking people what they valued and then how they act for nature. And this, as I'm sure you guys are aware, is very different for different individuals. So we did this through multiple, multiple channels, from social media campaigns, through to collating stories from wonderful volunteers that we have across the four countries, emails to our supporters, etc. And the stories that came back from this amazing project were incredible and just showed us how people were acting for nature in such diverse ways. And these pictures that you can see on the slide are actually pulled directly off the Actions for Nature website. So hedgehog hounds and going for walks with their dogs, people getting out. And as Chrissy has alluded to, obviously with COVID, nature and getting outdoors has become so important to people, more so than all normal. 
So from blogging to nature, to campaigning for a better and more sustainable future through to building bee boxes, all of these stories highlighted the fact that you do not have to have access to a huge garden or even be a part of a nature group or even know about nature in order to act necessarily act for it. Some people are doing it without even realising. And you can do small things that together make an impact on our natural world for the better. So why did we collect these stories? Well, because we wanted to ensure that the work we're doing is always relevant to the people that we can't, that we are engaging with across the different countries. And we want to ensure that the work we're doing is guided by those people, what they're passionate, what they love, and that they, what they have access to. Again, it needs to be relevant. So we're now using these stories to inspire others of the many and diverse ways in which you can help nature from either the comfort of your own home window boxes all the way through to community um, groups getting together in a local green space COVID dependent so these wonderful inspiring stories from people across the UK are actually now informing a piece of work um, that that was brought up at the beginning called join your dots um, at, that is going to be supporting individuals like yourselves to take action for nature in a way that is completely relevant and personal to you so by asking people to share their actions this coming summer, keep your eyes out, we will be creating in a sense, a movement of people acting for nature, a huge community across all four countries, a celebration of individual action, but on a large scale brought together, that becomes a community of people passionate about landscape and wildlife within it. So like I say, keep your eye out on social media and our website um, for other opportunities like this um, to see how you can get involved. Um, and like I say, that community, that space is in a fantastic platform for Chrissy and her campaigns team. That is why community is so important, as I'm sure you guys are so aware. It's such lovely, lovely to be a part of it. Slide please, Tobias. So very quickly, guys, what can you do? What, what, what did we learn from Actions for Nature? What actions can you take before we quickly move on to what campaigning actions you can take in specific? So here's just a couple of ideas that came through and hopefully you can see those. Plogging, if you've never heard of it before, it's completely new to me. Jogging and litter picking, or if you're anything like me and you can't run more than five meters, you can walk and litter pick. Um, be nature friendly in your garden. At the RSPB, we've actually got a whole load of guidance tips here hints on how you can recreate your natural spaces um, to make it kinder to nature. Eating sustainably, whether it's less and better meat or seasonal eating. Getting creative, which I know is not an obvious one, but for someone creative like myself, um, we actually saw so many people getting creative because of, inspired by, or within nature. And then they shared that on social media platforms with their families and friends. And that beautiful visual sense actually connected people to nature, people that may not want to obviously just go out for a walk, who love being indoors and being creative, but it connected them with the natural world and it gave them a passion for it. Or create a community garden, or show your passion for nature, campaign. And, whether, and as Chrissy said, it's not the obvious going for a march in the centre of London, whether it's signing online petitions or doing that march for nature when we can. Um, it's all about being a part of something bigger. So that brings you really nicely across to Chrissy and the amazing work she and her team do within campaigns. We bring the communities together within my team and the campaign, campaigns team then hopefully mobilizes these amazing people like yourselves, hopefully, uh, to have a voice and a platform to act for nature. So Sly, thank you Tobias and over to Chrissy. Thank you. Yep, so um, as uh, as Emma said, we're hopefully going to take that, um, camp uh, that community spirit and passion for nature and give you ways in which you can start taking action to fight for it. So you, if you support the RSPB, you've possibly already heard of Revive Our World, which is our big um, overarching campaign running through 2021. Um, and essentially, amongst other goals, our ultimate aim is to make sure that the government are writing nature's recovery into law. So um, on a domestic level, um, so that essentially one big part of that is the environment bill and just making sure that it's centre um, to everything that they're doing. So as I'm sure you're all aware, being nature lovers, that we've seen huge decline over the past few decades um, in, in nature. And at the end of 2020, we saw lots of countries worldwide, including the UK, um, fail to meet uh, nature recovery targets that they had signed up to in 2010. 
So as a part of um, a big climate summit, uh, sorry, I say climate summit, biodiversity summit in 2010, we basically set um, our sights on meeting these targets by 2020 and we didn't. So this year we will be signing on to um, more targets, which will take us through to 2030. So this is a real big year and a huge moment for us to influence the government and make sure that the, A, the targets that they set are ambitious and also that the government really show leadership in this space and ensure that we really do meet those targets in 2030. So that's what Revive Our World really is um, aiming to do. Um, because we do have the solutions, the scientists and environmentalists and NGOs like RSPB and National Trust have the solutions to mitigating the worst effects of climate change. And we just need to ensure that government are listening and um, show them that the UK and popula UK population such as yourselves are in support of this so that we can make this next decade count. Um, the main, one of the biggest messages we really want to get out for Revive Our World is the global impact that we have by taking action locally. So the policy decisions that government make in the UK have a global impact. We import a lot of our um, commodities from abroad and that has a huge impact on biodiversity and climate um, around the world. So we can really set the tone for what um, government intend to achieve um, in, in terms of it. Um, when um, implementing local legislation. Can I have the next slide, please, Tobias? I wondered why I couldn't change my slide. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, I'm very lost then. Um, I just wanted to uh, make note really and acknowledge the past year. Um, we entered 2020 calling it the year for nature and climate. We had a presidential election coming up, which could flip climate on its head one way or the other. We had two huge um, global conferences, one on biodiversity and one on climate. Um, the UK is writing new laws as a result of Brexit. It's a really huge year for us to influence nature's recovery um, and climate change. Um, but obviously, as we know, the pandemic um, did flip all of that on its head. People's priorities shifted, obviously. People were worried about health and livelihoods and their finances, and we were all restricted, which not only made campaigning very difficult, but it can give people a sense of powerlessness. Um, and it's very difficult to feel that you can influence the, the, the current uh, situation, which is something that runs true with nature and climate as well. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're familiar with that feeling of not really knowing what you can do and feeling very disconnected from government's decisions. Um, so Revive Our World really wants to um, what we call save nature through people, which is uh, allowing you to have a voice um, and demonstrating that support for nature through Revive Our World and everything we're doing with the rest of the movement, such as WI and TCC, and make sure that you're being heard. Um, and hopefully with Revive Our World, we can make sure that you guys have a say. Um, obviously, it's worth noting that whatever we do this year, we will be doing it as safely as possible. Um, and we're working to adapt to make sure that however, however we represent your voices, it's done so in a safe way. Can I have the next slide, please? Great. OK, so what can you um, look forward to um, for 2021 as a part of Revive Our World? So in the first part of the year, we're looking to local and national elections, which are coming up in May. So uh, mayoral and local council elections. Um, and what we're hoping to do is just ask everybody to essentially um, look to their candidates and ask them to vote or um, act with nature in mind, make sure that um, they are putting nature on their agenda. So as great as it is that we look at influencing global policy and letting that cascade, it's really great to also act from the, the ground up as well. And this is where you can have a real amount of power within your communities is influencing your local councils, um, whether that's cutting seasons or development. Um, so this, is, this will be the first key moment in our year really. Um, post sort of May and summer, we'll be looking at global campaigning. So like I said, we've got some really big moments coming up the end of the year so we will as i'm sure you've all been um doing so continuing to fight for the environment bill which does feel like it goes on and on but we've got more and more opportunities to keep building that momentum and bring in more voices and make sure that the government are really hearing um public support for nature to be essentially enshrined in the environment bill 
um, I didn't note it down in the list, but in summer, Revive Our World will be sort of kicking off this momentum for global campaigning with a big moment in summer. Um, because of COVID, these plans have been, um, we're going one, one step forward and two steps back. So this plan is still in development, but uh, whatever it is that we develop for summer, it will be about making sure that nature is, um, the profile of the nature crisis is, is, is raised really, because the climate crisis is often tackled in isolation from the nature crisis. And we really need to be calling on the government to link these two together. And the solutions that they develop to tackle climate need to include nature's recovery. And that's what we hope to be doing in summer. And then later on in the year, um, TCC, so the Climate Coalition will be um, launching a week long climate festival, which is really exciting. And the WI are also supporting as well, I believe. Um, and this is going to be a week long celebration really of nature. So we hope to see events happen all over the UK, um, really celebrating what you love about nature, what you're doing for nature um, and try and have a spotlight on that. It obviously COVID depending, um, these might be virtual, these might be social distance, but whatever those look like, it's going to be very vibrant and we want it to be full of art and culture and excitement so that we can bring everybody from the communities in um, to connect with nature. And then as we know, we've got two major um, global conferences coming up in October and November. So CBD COP15 is the Biodiversity Summit um, and almost like nature's equivalent. And then in November, we've got COP26, which is the United Nations um, Climate Summit, which is very excitingly being held in Glasgow in November. So these are our two, the two moments that we're really building towards. And we're hoping that through all of these other actions we're taking, we can take people on a journey, show the government how many people are celebrating nature, how many people are taking action for nature through all of the different things that we've been talking about. And we can really demonstrate that support to the government, um, especially in Glasgow, there will be a real spotlight on the UK government because they're here on home soil. And we're hoping to somehow illustrate just how many people are shouting, such as through the petition, the Revive Our World petition, your voices will be added up and we'll have a way of demonstrating to government just what the public really want. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, how can you get involved? In terms of taking action off the back of this presentation, um, obviously all of our campaigning actions for Revive Our World are still in development, but like you can see, there's lots of moments throughout the year that you will be able to get involved with. We'll have virtual opportunities, physical opportunities, social media opportunities. So if you sign the petition, um, you'll be kept up to date with all of the things that we'll be doing um, and you'll have the option to take action for all of those moments. Um, and I think there's a good chance a lot of you have already done this, but um, signing on to the TCC's declaration. So the time is now, which is the Climate Coalition's campaign, is something that the RSPB is supporting quite heavily this year. Um, so that's another way for you to um, take action. The Revive Our World is very much nature and TCC is obviously very much focusing on climate. So if you want to demonstrate support for both, those are both two really good places to go. Emma? Thanks, Chrissy. And uh, just on the other points there that you can see, guys, obviously there's the Action for Nature follow up, the Join Your Dots uh, project coming out this summer. So keep an eye on our social media channels or via our website. Uh, we'll be telling you a bit about that in a second. And obviously, if you we actually have an RSPB community. So simply Google RSPB community. Again, we'll send these links through to you guys. Um, and you can be a part of a forum that discusses how, as a community, you might help the nature near you. Um, so we'll be sending through as many links as we can to Fiona and the gang at WI um, if you'd like to follow up on anything that we've spoken through today folks so please don't worry at all if you feel like you've missed anything. Um, I just wanted to take uh, time on behalf of Chrissy and myself and all of the members of the RSPB to say thank you so so much for your time guys. Um, here as you, hopefully on the next slide if Tobias doesn't mind um, forwarding that for me sorry I'm so used to doing <laughs> myself sorry guys um you've got our website uh, which will include within our links you've got the handle that you can use on social media to see where, where where we are and what we're doing um and like i say they all both have loads of tips and resources advice on how you can support the nature near you um and our social media again we'll be sharing all our 
upcoming opportunities. We've got some fantastic projects coming this spring about the nature right near you. So just to, to, to add um, to a chat that happened earlier um, and opportunities to get involved, including those that, that Chrissy has outlined to support the new movement for nature. So I do apologize that we've slightly gone over on time, um, but please ask anything that you'd like. And if there are any questions that we, either Chrissy or myself feel might take a little longer to answer, um, Fiona has very kindly suggested that you could email your questions to her and we'll collate and get back to you as soon as we're able. So over to you guys and thank you again. Very much uh, Emma and Chrissy for that. That was a, a really interesting talk and I uh, could see we were going over in time but I really didn't want to stop you. Um, the same applied to when Keith was talking because uh, the whole purpose of today is for our members to be informed about what both organisations are, are doing and how we can uh, take part to help in any other environmental uh, things, uh, be it campaigns or actual action on the ground. So Thank you to the three of you for that. Um, I know that we've come up to two o'clock and some of you may need to leave, uh, but I was hoping that we could have, say, 10 minutes further of questions. So if anybody wants to stay on for a further 10 minutes, uh, you're very welcome to do so. But if you do need to leave, that's understandable as well. And apologies for running over in time. Um, now, Fiona has kindly uh, been monitoring the chat pane for me. Um, so we're just going to pick on a few questions, uh, and as you rightly said, uh, we can of course send questions on if need be. So Fiona, who have we got first? So the first question I've seen is from Pauline from Fulshaw WY. So Pauline has asked, um, she said that peat bogs are carbon sinks. What are the prospects for the government banning peat compost, peat sales for compost? And that's specifically focused to the National Trust. Um, it's one of our, well, it's been a policy of not supplying peat, uh, but the amount of peat that comes into the country at bottom of pots, uh, and it's amazing when you see peat free stuff, it doesn't actually mean peat free on it. Uh, the peat bogs at the moment are actually carbon sources because of their condition. Um, as they're oxidizing and they're leaching uh, carbon out. So you've got the horticultural use. And I know Monty Don was hammered a bit in the press about a month ago on saying that we have to go peat free onto it. The National Trust, the Woodland Trust, RSPB, we all agree we need to go uh, down that way. And I think that I think the government's finally coming round to it, but we, we need to keep the pressure uh, on government uh, on this. When you're looking the sequestering on peat bogs, because they're so slowly developed, they're easily destroyed really quickly. But to get them back to fun functioning, we need to slow the flow. We need to keep the water uh, in the uplands. We need to get them back into favourable conditions. So it's both a land management question and there's a legislative question of get rid of the market um, for peat. Because if you can't supply it into the market, they will then stop digging it up. It, it doesn't really happen in the UK. Ireland have finally closed their peat powered fire, uh, power station about six or seven months ago. So that they're also moving towards it. So it's going in the right direction, should we say, but it still needs a voice on it. Thank you, Keith. Um, I, in the comments, I've seen that uh, people are saying that uh, our resolution on the peat box wasn't well supported. Um, I, I think it was the fact that it wasn't well supported. There were others that came higher up, so it's not going to be a resolution this year for uh, the annual meeting. Uh, but having said that, local federations and local WIs could pass a resolution on this if they felt strongly enough. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you can't work on it if you wanted to, as long as you pass a local resolution. Uh, but I totally agree, peat box could be the answer. Uh, yeah, to make sure that they help us with the carbon, but they have to be properly managed because currently they're not. Uh, the next question, Fiona. Um, so the next question I've seen is from Fiona Barry. Um, and she said that one of the greatest ways to help is planting trees or hedges. Um, not everyone has a garden large enough to plant trees. So how can we encourage our local councils to use spare land to plant and maintain woodland or copses? Yeah, and I think there was one as well, which was about not cutting verges, uh, encouraging councils mm. to not cut verges in the summer, etc. So um, I think they both link together. Um, yeah. so Emma or Chris, do you want to say something about those? 
we'll probably both have different takes on this. <laughs> um, I mean, I support what Emma will say, which is, um, I, I, I can I can hear my policy colleagues are telling me that you know that there's um, v various different ways, obviously, that you can encourage nature and biodiversity back into your local areas. Trees being one of them, but pollinating uh, wild, uh, wildflowers sorry in your gardens or in your um window boxes obviously another way um in terms of influencing local councils obviously that's something that you can work to do by coming together within your community to um appeal to your local council in terms of actually changing the way they operate um and cutting seasons and things like that would would be one way that you can maybe have long-term sustainable change um i haven't really got time to you you, some of you might be masters at this already anyway, so I probably don't need to tell you how to engage with your local councils. But um, if you do need help, we've got the webinar on the RSPB campaigning web pages about um, engaging with your, just starting to engage with your local councils. But yeah, like, there's, a, there's so many different campaigns and ways that you can get involved in terms of influencing um, policy. But Emma, I don't know if you want to talk about any um, community sort of projects. Yeah, thanks, Chrissy. So, I mean, just to really add to what Chrissy's just said, um, the only uh, thing to quickly bring up, guys, because I know we're sh short on time, is that there are loads of different community building, community organising groups that are there su to support uh, small community groups um, to do exactly that, uh, you know, small projects and pieces of work for wildlife. Uh, one that immediately springs to mind is the Orchard Project. Um, I'll try and include a link to their work. They help uh, plant trees in all sorts of contexts and they ensure that those trees are suitable uh, for biodiversity, etc. So um, we can pop more information across as and when, but thanks guys. On, on the Verge one, I know that um, the uh, Wildlife Trust have really been, shall we say, hitting the councils hard and the, the way that they've been engaging with the councils is on cost saving, really. Uh, on it, that uh, less cutting, more biodiversity, less cost on it. It's, it's in theory, it's quite a good, strong argument. I, my, my gut feeling on tree planting and local authorities is they're they're about to go um, stratospheric on this because they will see it as part of their carbon budget. But the problem is, is it the right tree in the right place? It does need to be looked at properly because some we've got. Um, uh, 20,000 hectares of new woodland um, going in in the next 10 years. Is it the right tree in the right place? Does it join habitats together? There's a lot more thinking than just plon plonking a tree in a place. Will the tree actually survive? Is it good in drought? There's a lot of questions to ask on it. But I think we, we are turning a corner as a nation in this, but it needs to be done in an informed sort of way. Thank you, Keith. I agree. Um, there's no point doing things if we're not having a plan where we'll all work together um, and we need to be part of that leadership to make sure that the plan is right. So thank you for the three of you. Um, could we have one more? And I know that people are dropping out now because they really are busy and I think some of our speakers may have to go as well. Yeah. But one final question, Fiona, please. So um, I'm going to merge two questions that are related. So um, Michelle from Pushan Bells has asked, um, that, you know, she really loves the fact that people have gone out in the local actual national areas under lockdown, but she's noticed some environmental damage due to the increased footfall. What can she and other um, WI members do about this when they see it? Thank you, Fiona. Uh, who'd like to speak about this? I, I can start from a personal perspective. Um, because uh, there's a saying in Welsh, which is Mr. Square, my square mile. I've really got to know it really well uh, in this lockdown. And the amount of footpaths that have closed, the amount of footpaths we've lost, and the amount of damage from fly tipping and of uh, increased wear and tear, I have to say, I, I have enough to say that the council doesn't do a lot of stuff sometimes, but be, they've got what my council and I suppose most councils have got quite good reporting portals specifically on wear and tear and on fly tipping uh, onto it and even though they don't tell me they've done it I then go back and they have done it so th there are ways to engage with the local authority if it comes under the highways act or if it comes under a waste um, legislation but I am picking up a lot more wear and tear and 
they can't eat at the moment they have no budgets to fix potholes let alone what's happening uh in the countryside but if we keep letting them know if we keep quiet they won't think it's important because how can they know unless we people on the ground uh, let them know that there is an issue or a problem yes and i was going to say um if, if oh sorry chrissy <laughs> No, really, it's fine. Um, I was just, just to add to what uh, Keith has said, which is a, a completely valid and, and really invaluable point. Um, I think it's also, from a community's point of view, it's about informing people and giving them better access to the local nature near them. Um, because I feel that for a lot of those people, you're completely right to whoever asked that question. Um, a lot of people, if they don't have access to nature in their local space, they don't interact with nature on a day-to-day -day basis and they've not been brought, brought up in that kind of space with that information and knowledge being passed to them, then of course they don't understand how to necessarily treat the natural environment when they go out into areas of natural beauty, etc. So. I think it's, it is about informing, but I think it's also about investing as a sector into local green space within urban populations and just larger population um, centres to make sure that people don't always have to go so far into these beautiful, very protected areas. They can actually connect with nature very close to where they live. So I'll let Chrissy add what she's got to say to that as well. I don't really have anything to add actually it's such a multi-pronged approach it's uh, holistic isn't it we've got people who don't have access to nature like you say so we need to educate people on how to connect with it locally um, how to look after it when they get there um, uh, protected areas need better monitoring at the moment they're not monitored effectively which is why there's presumably litter and path erosion and things like that um, so yeah it's multi-pronged and I don't really have anything to add particularly to any of that um, but can I, on everybody's behalf, thank the three speakers, Keith, Emma and Chrissy, uh, for such an interesting afternoon. Uh, the comments in the chat box have been uh, very uh, complimentary to everything that you've said and the presentations that you've given. So thank you for the time in preparing them uh, and gearing them specifically for our WI members. Um, I, I can rely on our WI members uh, who are passionate about show the love campaign and climate change, uh, that they will be taking action. Uh, we are so lucky that we have this voice that we can be part of the climate coalition um, and make sure that our argument is being heard loud and clear. So thank you to the three of you for giving up your time. Uh, thank you to the public affairs team, uh, Fiona, Tobias, Alexandra and Anne for all their hard work on this. Everybody that's joined us today, giving up their time to be part of this afternoon's session. Um, and if your question hasn't been asked and you'd like an answer for it, can you please email the department and we will get an answer to you. Uh, and as I said earlier, this recording will go onto our YouTube channel so you can share it with somebody who wasn't fortunate enough to be part of it this afternoon. Um, and don't forget uh, next week at the same time from one to two, we will have another session on craftivism and the Climate Coalition. So. Uh, thank you all very much for joining uh, and have a good afternoon. Diolch yn fawr i chi gyd.